Italy, one of the greatest countries on earth. It's achingly, achingly beautiful. It's like a mirage. I'm Alex Polizzi, and my Italian heritage is intrinsic to who I am. Buongiorno. I've got a treasure trove of childhood memories that were made here. Now I'm returning on a voyage of discovery that will take me from top to toe. It gives me shivers to be back. Immersing myself in the culture of its vast regions. <laughs> Reconnecting with my roots. Hi, darling. And uncovering some of this magnificent country's secrets. This has completely blown me away. Wow. Wow. This is one of the glories of Italy. And if you haven't seen it, you really should come. I've crossed off the capital from my itinerary, and I've arrived in the southern Campania region, an area of both obvious and unconventional beauty from the quirkiness of Naples to the scenic retreat that is the tranquil Amalfi Coast. Naples is my first stop. A vast, noisy warren of streets. Italy's third largest city. One of my grandfathers was Neapolitan, so I know it well. But to anyone who's not a native, it can feel like a rather aggressive place. To me, there's nowhere else in Italy quite like it. This is an amazing view. It, it does give you the feeling of just how enormous Naples is. Greater Naples has almost four million people living in it, over one million in the center. And it's one of the most populated areas in Europe. And it shows from here, doesn't it? People think of Italy and they think of the seaside or the Amalfi Coast. They think of Venice, they think of Florence. They don't expect this urban sprawl. I'm very fond of Naples, though. I've always found it quite incredible that so many people live here, when a reminder of the city's ominous geography looms wherever you turn. Humankind has a habit of building in some pretty impossible places. Everyone here lives in the shadow of Vesuvius, and Naples itself is built in the crater of the Phlegrium Fields. It must be pretty terrifying if you let yourself think about it. This is the most densely populated volcanic region in the world, which means that for Neapolitans, life is full of uncertainty. And with the 1944 eruption of Vesuvius still haunting many, it's not a question of if history will repeat itself, but when. Dr. Luca Dauria is a researcher at the city's volcanic observatory, where the activity of the volcanoes is monitored 24 hours a day. So, Luca, you here keep an eye on Vesuvius, Ischia, and the Phlegrian fields. We are carefully monitoring all these three volcanoes with different means. So what you see here is uh, our seismogram. So we yeah. are showing uh, the motion of the ground be below. For instance, an example of a tiny earthquake recorded tonight at Vesuvius. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a very, very tiny earthquake, <laughs> the magnitude being less than, yes, 0 0.4. But in the case of volcanoes, they are important for us because often before eruption, there are swarms of small mm. earthquakes. When you consider that the west of the city is actually built upon volcanic land known as the Phlegrian Fields, activity like this can and has had terrifying consequences. In the 1980s, thousands of families in one suburb had to be evacuated for several months it was one of the most serious crises to hit Italy in recent history. And worryingly, the tremors have started again. So Vesuvius is the famous one, of course, but the really dangerous thing at the moment is the Phlegrian Fields, isn't it? Uh, yes, this is true because it is showing something of what we call 
technically unrest. In September 2012, there was a swarm of about 2,000 earthquakes in less about one hour. So everyone got nervous? Yeah, yeah. And while in Vesuvius we know likely the next eruption will be uh, inside the cone, yes. in Campi Ferre, uh, yeah. the volcano could happen, could open everywhere. We're currently standing within the Phlegrian fields, but it's still difficult to imagine that the land could erupt anywhere, at any time. Luca and his team have a well-versed protocol to follow. I love it. There is actually a red phone. I love it. Yeah, it's a, a red phone which is in communication with the uh, uh, Italian civil protection in Rome. So every time there is an event, we are required to communicate immediately to the Italian civil protection. So do you think that if you live in Naples, you take the threat of these volcanoes seriously? Yeah, I think so, because mm, most people are aware uh, they are living in a volcanic area. They see Vesuvius every day. Obsessed of, about it. Yeah, <laughs> I would say, I would yeah. say scared, yes, really scared, course. yeah. It's OK uh, to be aware of the risk, but currently there is no reason <laughs> to worry about Vesuvius because it is sleeping. Living in the shadow of Vesuvius has always influenced the way Neapolitans live their lives. This is an incredibly religious city, and its people are hugely superstitious too. On almost every corner, you'll find shrines of all kinds built as figures of worship. But there is one place that really speaks about the spirit of the people of Naples. Well, this is Fontanella Cemetery, and it's... I mean, I've heard about it. I've never been here before. It's incredibly evocative, and it feels very peaceful, which I wasn't really expecting. Apparently, there's eight million bones here, dating from the 16th century, when there was a terrible plague that ripped through Naples, and most of these bodies have, have never been identified. So it's become a common resting ground. <sighs> Not a bad place to lay your last earthly remains. This place has been taken to the people of Naples' hearts. People still come here and light candles and say prayers here. And I think people who don't have the bodies of their own loved ones to mourn over adopted skulls and honoured in whatever way they could. And this is a cemetery of poor people. This was specifically bones of people who were too poor to afford a proper burial. And so the poor of Naples come to worship the poor dead. Things like the little coffins, of course. I've got children. You know, they break your heart. I must admit, I've added my own small token to that pile. Never hurts to say a prayer in the hope of grace being shown to you. So that is one of the most famous skulls here, the skull of Donna Concetta, who's famous at helping women with conception. And she's known as the skull that sweats. Apparently, if she's going to grant your request, then she slightly perspires. And that is why she is so much shinier than the other skulls around her. There's a real cult of devotion around Donna Concetta. And I must say, when you're desperate, you'll try any port in the storm. The fact that these long-term dead are still being honored in the way that they are, I think is a sign that Neapolitans are very in touch both with their pasts and with their fears for the future. This is a fatalistic city, and I think it's, it's always lived in the shadow of Vesuvius, and so death is very present to them. There's nothing morbid about this place. You could easily spend an hour or two immersed here, but it's just one example of what makes this such a curious city. There are many more still to be found. Mm -hmm. 
I've always felt that Naples has an authentic grittiness. What I love about Naples is I love the kind of vibrancy, the energy. It's a dirty place. It's a very, very busy place. A lot of people live here, and it feels like it. This feels like the, the true Italy in some ways. And you have to be quite brave to dive into the Warren of back streets. This is Rione Sanita, one of central Naples' most deprived districts. But beneath its ordinary exterior, it's built quite an extraordinary reputation for itself. 300 years ago, Sanita contributed 90% of the world's production of gloves to the fashion industry. And today, down a dusty side street, I'm told there's one business still considered to be the best glove makers in the world. I have a long-standing interest in family businesses, especially ones that have existed, like this one, for four generations. This looks like a very residential area. It's not where I'd expect any kind of factory. But appearances can be deceiving. From these modest premises, Mauro Squilace is busy crafting handmade leather gloves for some of the world's leading designers. I think every woman's wardrobe needs a little leather, and mine is ready for a revamp. Sono Alex Polizzi. Gosh, look at these. I mean, honestly, how pretty are those? Look at the colour. This is beautiful. I'm being treated to a preview of what's going to be adorning the most manicured hands next season. Ooh la la, these are coming home with me. Mmm, that's very chic. These extravagant gloves, lined with the finest cashmere and silk, are soon to be shipped to the likes of Dior and Chanel in Paris and Milan. <gasps> They'll fetch hundreds of pounds per pair. I love these. These fit me perfectly. How much does a glove like this cost? This one in uh, Paris, six or seven hundred euros. No. <gasps> Black they may be, classic they may be, but I still think they're sexy. I feel my inner leather fetish coming to the fore. I see a woman with the glove is a... Uh, dress. Dress. I'm sure my husband would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the region's strong tradition in tanning and dyeing leather that won it its reputation. And Mauro's family has dedicated their lives to the craft. So, how many glove makers are there like you in Salita? Uh, in the past, there is 100. And now? Now, yes. I am alone. <gasps> How did you finish. survive and no one else did? Because my philosophy yes. is uh, uh, to have a quality. Yeah. Because uh, today in marketing, there is no medium quality. Mauro travels the world sourcing the finest lamb's leather, a material that was made for gloves. So, this is too big for me. So, what size am I? Uh, imagine that uh, there is no real size because he's one of is a handicraft. Of course. There is no one uh, uh, article, same on other. Uh, in the same leather, if I cut one pair here on leather, yeah. another one in bottom, it is different. Oh. It's different in stretch, in uh, softness. The best one is here. Is it? Because uh, near to the bottom, the, the lamb... It is, sits uh, down. It yeah. rests on that side, so it's a bit more worn. There are more imperfections on the rump than there are on the shoulder, for obvious reasons. Astonishingly, 60,000 pairs of gloves are produced here every year. But what's even oh, more impressive is that for each glove, there are 25 intricate stages of production. Mauro said he gets very upset when he goes to sell and people call his gloves accessories. These are not accessories. A belt is an accessory. A glove is a work of art. Whilst every stage of the craft work is rigorously checked by Mauro and his team, it's a small army of women living in the Sanita district who painstakingly stitch each glove using these 80-year-old machines. Absolutely love that. And did you see how quickly she did it? Quanti anni ha fatto questo lavoro, signora? Cinque, sei. Sessanta. 
So I just, I asked how many years she'd been doing this job and she did this and I said, oh, well, six years, she did 60 years she's been doing this job. Ma ha cominciato come bambina la rassegna. 14 anni. She started at 14. 75. Ma le porta benissimo, signora. Si vede che è un lavoro salutario. Ma noi siamo bambini. Ah, è bambini. Non ci vogliamo arrendere perché ci piace lavorare. Italy has a huge tradition of peace work, and I did know about that. Um, but honestly, to have 60,000 pairs of gloves a year made like this, 25 sets at a time, is rather overwhelming. Who would have thought that you'd come up these slightly squalid stairs to find the centre of Neapolitan glove making? Not me. The city's food scene holds a few surprises too. The cuisine here is as varied as its history, but the most ancient tradition of them all is street food. This is the Neapolitan's take on fast food. For centuries, people have filled up on dishes that are cheap to produce, yet rich in their flavor. But I have to say, some are more appealing than others. Tripe, pig's trotters, marrow bone, all the things which, frankly, have become too rich to eat in England. Brawn are still eaten here regularly. I remember eating tripe with beans with my grandmother. Can't say I'm thrilled or looking particularly forward to trying it again today. <laughs> Grazie. This is calf's head. This isn't quite what I was expecting. Mmm, well not. It's delicious. It's boiled. A bit of salt and lemon, really taking me back to my childhood. We in the rich Western world have got used to eating things like fillet, but that's only one bit. And there's a lot of other bits that we leave behind. But if you're going to eat like a true Neapolitan, then there's one speciality that has been fueling the locals in this part of town since 1945. Near the port, at La Masardona, Enzo and his family are famous for an unusual spin on a traditional dish, fried pizza. Tutti i giorni è così, la mattina a sera. No, qualche giorno peggio. <laughs> Prima colazione le mangio. Pizza fritta. Pizza. A Napoli nasce come, come, come tipo breakfast in Inghilterra. Sì. Allora, prima di andare al lavoro, prendevi la tua pizza fritta e andavi... No, quando tornavi dal lavoro, prima di andare al lavoro. So he works 7 in the morning until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it only is open on a Saturday night. Come mai il sabato? Uno non deve troppo stancare. Sì. Cioè, non deve... Mm, devi desiderare la pizza. Sì, 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 sì. Quindi allora io so che la trovo un giorno, la desidero. Ah. Se la trovo tutti i giorni... Non la desidero. This is the city of philosophers. Come si mangia la pizza? Sì, fammi vedere. Il profumo? Mmm, buonissimo. Guarda lo spessore della pasta, molto sì. sottile. Sì. So this is how you're supposed to eat it. Take the corners and you use it to scoop out the middle. OK. OK. Mmm. <laughs> È molto è... delicata questa Questo cosa. Questo è buonissimo. È molto delicata come pizza. Mm. Enzo and his fried pizza have reached legendary status in Naples, and deservedly so. As proof, he's even been immortalized with his very own figurine. This is considered to be the ultimate accolade in Naples. And the origins of this quirky tradition can be discovered in one of my favorite places in the city. So we're in Via San Gregorio Armeno, otherwise known as Christmas Alley, and here it is Christmas all year round. This tiny alley is the heart and soul of the Neapolitan Christmas and is one of the most famous places in Naples to wander. The intricate figurines made by artists and craftsmen draw a stream of curious customers, and it all began with a devotion to the nativity scene. Giuseppe Cesarini's family business has been here since 1834, creating little characters for mangers in the most astonishing detail. 
Allora, questo è un bambino Gesù? Sì. E lo fa in argilla? Sì. In argilla. E fa sempre tutto in argilla? Sì, sempre, ma, su richiesta, ma me l'hanno chiesto in argilla e adesso lo sto facendo in argilla. Però io lo, lo faccio anche in legno o in cartapesta. Quanto tempo ci pre prende per fare, per esempio, un bambin Gesù? Ma io normalmente mh, mi prendo non, me non meno di un mese di tempo per sì, farlo. Sì, mamma perché, mia. Ma no, perché tra la modellatura, l'asciugamento, poi deve andare in cottura. Sì. E l'ha fatto da sempre questo sì, lavoro? Sì, da mio padre. Fatto da, io da quando sono nato ho fatto sempre ed esclusivamente questo lavoro di scultura. Da mio padre ho imparato, sì. E lo fa suo che figlio? Che sta in foto lì alla, alla parete. E ci tengo, lo faccio sempre presente perché um, è merito suo se io ho continuato questa attività. Over the years, the idea of the manger has evolved from the traditional to the spectacular. Alongside religious figurines, you can now find some craftsmen furnishing their mangers with a motley crew of characters. I can see the Pope, I can see Pavarotti, I can see Marilyn Monroe, I can see Princess Catherine and Prince Harry. I think that's Angela Merkel over there. <laughs> it takes someone very dedicated to the cause of the EU to take an Angela Merkel home. I'm not quite sure I'm that dedicated. There's a real sense of humor and craft here, and I mean, you have to be very skilled to make this look as lifelike and as appealing as they, as they manage to here. I don't find this stuff tacky in the least. But I do find it intriguing that religion isn't all that's celebrated in Christmas Alley. Jenny Di Virgilio's unique creations are all about good luck. He's very cool, look at him. Mi piace tantissimo lui. Questo è lo coscio sciò contro il malocchio, vedi? Ci porta la gobba. Sì, so, first of all, if you see someone with a hump, it's lucky to rub it, which is why you can see he's rubbed smooth, poi. Poi vedi, ha tutti gli amuleti contro il malocchio. Il ferro di cavallo, so, ci sono i cornetti, so, le corna e il corno rosso che non deve mai. So, there are all the amulets. There's the corno that you do against the evil eye. If you think someone's giving you the evil eye, you always do that down the ground. E perché i peperoni? Perché hai i peperoncini insieme e allontanano il malocchio. Oh, it has to be red. Perciò si accoppiano. To... Ah, so garlic and peperoncino together send the evil eye away. So these are all the old, old rituals from time immemorial people have done the corna. And the Protestants have always been superstitious. I have to say to you, I am not superstitious in an ordinary sense. I don't think twice about walking under a ladder or a black cat. But I too always do the corna and Questo I too... This is the corna that I give you and you. Put it always in the task. I'll do it. And put it well. Grazie. He's given me this for good luck. I'm so thrilled. I love these. I've got a gold one that I will wear on a chain around my neck. All my family do. Grazie. Grazie a te. I find fascinating is that religion and superstition coexist so closely and they see no problem in that. I think it's lovely that two such opposing ideas can both have equal power and strength here in Naples. Naples is a city full of surprises and contrasts. It's a somewhat fitting end to my visit that, amidst the chaos of Christmas Alley, I should discover a jewel of serenity the baroque beauty that is the San Gregorio Armeno Church. Isn't this wonderful? Right in the heart of such a busy city and right off such a busy alleyway is this haven, this oasis of peace. It's quite unbelievable. Uh, Naples has just retreated all of a sudden very far away. This is the perfect prelude to my next stop, a world away from this mysterious city. Heading ever further south, an hour's drive from Naples, you'll reach the breathtaking Amalfi Coast. This is the image that most tourists conjure when they think of holidays in Italy. Here, ancient hillside villages cling to cliffs, lemon groves thrive, and sparkling seas shimmer from every hairpin bend. But abandon the car and weave your way into the hills, and you'll be rewarded with a treat for all the senses. Perched on this rocky outcrop just outside the village of Ravello is a historic Villa Cimbrone. Oh, 
I'm very grateful to be in this blissful peace and quiet with the serenity of the sea and this gorgeous green all around me after the madness of Naples. It's a panacea. I love the Amalfi Coast. It was my favorite part of my wonderful honeymoon. I came here with my husband and we drove these vertiginous roads. It's amazing it's as inhabited, as populous and as popular as it is because it's quite hard to get to. The roads are not for the unwary, let's say. And um, here too, you have to take your courage in your hands. Villa Cimbrone has a colorful thousand year history, much of it English inspired. Discovered by Ernest William Beckett during the Grand Tour, it became an aristocratic residence and a famous meeting place for notable names from the world of arts and politics. Churchill, Virginia Woolf, and the famous Bloomsbury set were all drawn here. More recently, it's been lived in and restored to its elegant glory by the Villumiere family. And today, it's an exclusive hotel for the rich and famous to retreat to. A restorative week spent here will cost you up to 8,000 euros. But the real allure of Villa Cimbrone are the English-inspired gardens. Open to the public, the restored boulevards and opulent rose-scented cloisters are well worth a wonder. Giorgio, who was raised here, has overseen the changes. And lei si occupa del giardino. And cosa c'è di speciale di questo giardino? Il mio obiettivo è ricostruire lo spirito essenziale del giardino. Ed era importante perché è un giardino a episodi, con giardino nel giardino. Ogni elemento rappresenta un'emozione diversa. So it's a very romantic idea of the garden, that there's different rooms almost, and every stage of the garden represents a different emotion, and you have to try and feel that emotion as you go into the different aspects of the garden. If you let it, this place can have a profound effect on you. Beckett's deep depression was said to have lifted during his time here, and it certainly struck a chord with artists throughout the years. Can you imagine Wagner coming here with, on horseback with his friends from the area and sitting on the Belvedere and eating and drinking? Ma in che stato era quando voi eravate bambini? Pessimo. Pessimo. Insomma, del giardino c'era soltanto il viale e la parte laterale che era in qualche maniera coltivata e tenuta bene. Tutto il resto, insomma, era una sorta di bosco. Scattered around the garden, visitors will come across thought-provoking statements from famous authors. This is an Omar Khayyam piece, our moon of my delight that knows no way, and the moon of heaven is rising once again. How oft hereafter rising shall she look through the same garden after us in vain. So the idea is that you should read this and look at the garden and think upon the brevity of one's own life and enjoy every moment while one can. These gardens are considered to be one of the finest examples of English garden design in Europe, but standing on the infinity terrace, it feels distinctly Mediterranean. Here, it's been said that one feels the desire to fly. Giorgio just said to me that anyone with any sensitivity gazing out on this view will feel the hand of the divine. I mean, this is a view that has been appreciated since Roman times, although I find it rather tantalizing that the sea is so far away from me. I think the whole point about this coastline is the sea and the cliffs that fall so precipitously directly into the sea. In his epic Odyssey, Homer called this stretch of the Amalfi Coast the land of the sirens, and legend has it that these mythical creatures would sing to the sailors as they pass by. But it's more than just an area of natural beauty. This is the Punta Campanella Marine Park, 33 kilometers of coast that have been afforded protected status. 
Beneath these waters, it's an ecological treasure trove of unusual habitats and species. And among them, a few gastronomical delicacies thrive. The parapandolo is a sought-after shrimp that has to be tried if it's on the menu. But fishing for the shrimp isn't easy. For starters, it requires bespoke, handcrafted nets. For nearly a century, locals like Salvatore have been weaving with wicker and even olive tree branches to make these shrimp nets. It's thought that the smell of the cane, together with the bait, is the ultimate temptation for the otherwise elusive creatures. Antonio, who crews one of the few boats permitted to fish in the park, has specialist knowledge of where to seek them out. Sempre la tradizione di pescatori. Diciamo che adesso è meno pesce. Perché ci stanno. Prima si pescava un po' più a periodo e di meno, sì. con meno attrezze. Sì. Perché non ci stavano gli strumenti questi qua, si lavorava con le mani. Sì, e lei Troppe ha fatto. Non sono sposato. No, non è sposato. Si è sposato col mare. Ah, perché non ha un son per continuare la sua tradizione. Dove vive? Giù alla spiaggia proprio. Sì. Ah, he lives right on the beach. Ten meters away from the beach. So it really is his life. Cosa pensi di pescare, prendere, tirare su? Un po' di gamberette prendiamo. Lo spaghetti, lo il liquido con gamberette. Yum, yum. It's almost a hundred meters deep here. I ask because look how much rope he's pulling up. This is not a job for the unfit. C'è poca roba. Eh, c'è poca, ma però quando è la prima pesca sempre di meno. Guarda, sono pochi, ma guarda, sono belle grandi. Mm. Eh? Li mangia mai crude? Sì, sì, sì. sì. Non voglio tornare. Dai, vai. Non fanno niente, solo... Eh, Lo so, ma... Uh! <ride> I just cannot I'm afraid. And I like raw prawns. I just don't think I can hold one long enough to pull its head off. I see. There's a few more there. I'll be to write home about them. This is a very tough way of making a living. Call me traditional, but I prefer my food that comes from the sea to be served on a plate. So I'm taking Antonio's advice and having this morning's catch with Linguina. I feel slightly guilty using the last few shrimp in the sea for my pasta, but not guilty enough not to eat it. There you go. That's it. Mmm. Mmm. Best way to eat shrimp is with your fingers and to suck any juice that you can out of it. Mmm. Delicious. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. Mmm. Seafood doesn't come fresher than this, but it's just one of many tastes of the Campania region's cuisine. I'm about to discover that the real flavor of Italian cooking can be found growing among this rich and fertile land. My time in the Campania region has been as remarkable for the food as for the stunning scenery from which it's produced. I've been on a culinary adventure from the nostalgia of street food to the finest Michelin starred fare. But I'm still yet to experience the simple cooking that I remember my grandmother's for. So I believe behind this wall is Mama Agata's cookery school. Celebrities of every size and shape have beaten their way to this door, and I'm there next in line. Buongiorno. Oh, ciao, ciao. Alex. Buongiorno. Come Bene, e tu? Please, welcome in. I'll show you my hidden treasure, Alex. 
For the past 10 years, Chiara Lima has been running this world-renowned cookery school in the tiny cliffside village of Ravello. The family secrets are shared with up to a thousand students a year. The school was born from the legendary talents of Chiara's mother, Mama Agata, for whom cooking has always been at the heart of family life. While living a simple existence here, her recipes have amazingly gathered a star-studded fan base. How did your mum start cooking? And what kind of style of food does she do? She started, she was only eight years old. I mean, she, was, uh, she is one of eight brother and sister. Uh, and uh, she was born in the Second World War. So when the parents left to be in the garden to work, to uh, make food for them to eat, she was cooking already for the family, eight years old. Uh, she learned a lot from her mother and her grandmother. Mm. So what we are cooking today is extremely traditional just passed from generation to generation. At the age of just 13, Chiara's mother went to cook for a rich American woman who lived in the village and had some famous Hollywood connections. My mother cooked for Jacqueline Kennedy in 1962 for Fred Astaire. They were filming Cleopatra in Rome. Liz Taylor and Richard Burton came into the villa and my mother cooked for them. There was Humphrey Bogart that was in Ravello and uh, after the film she cooked for him and he loved her lemon cake. We used to call her Baby Agatha and he would go, Baby Agatha, I love your food but I love your lemon cake. So she was baking three times a day <laughs> because they loved her food. So I thought, well, if they loved her food, maybe we can teach uh, some traditional cooking and tell me this is your land isn't it yeah well we grow a lot here we grow everything we have lemons all what you see below are lemon grove here are the garden the herba garden over there all the vegetables uh, the potatoes uh, but we also have uh, olive trees so we make our own extra virgin olive oil mm. we can 3,000 jar of tomatoes a year we start four o'clock we finish at midnight for a couple My of weeks goodness darling I yeah. bet you don't so you don't go away on holiday much we don't have much time. It's quite a privilege to be invited into this kitchen, the heart of this family's home for 250 years. Mama, let me introduce you this beautiful girl, yeah, Alex Grazie. She's from yeah. England. OK, Alex, I heard you love uh, the food of your grandma and your, uh, yes. you know, when they used to cook. And uh, the way that we're cooking today is very, very traditional. Fine. It's uh, Mama Agata tomato sauce. Great! Yeah, it's, uh, pro it's the sauce that we will always have on the stove for cooking anything. Everything. So yeah. it's the base for a million other dishes. Yes. I'm hoping I can tease a few secrets out of this pair. OK, Alex, of course, extra virgin olive oil. And then we're using uh, uh, gloves of garlic, yeah. very simple, and a uh, few leaves of basil. The first thing is that the garlic is not chopped. The reason why we don't chop because this is a basic tomato sauce. You don't want the flavor of the garlic to be predominant. So OK. And the same, you know, the basil. <laughs> I know never on earth. Yeah. God because forbid. It, <laughs> and another very important thing is the oil. You know, very often we read or we hear, heat the oil, drop the garlic, burn the garlic. So what I'm going to do now is to bring the temperature of the extra virgin olive oil gently, gently up. The olive oil alone absorbs the flavor from the garlic and the basil. If you see the oil, you can hear with your ears a sizzling. And when the oil becomes too hot, start to spit. Means Chiara, stop talking. Because otherwise you burn the garlic. Okay, so fine. at this point, I'm going to pour the tomato sauce. Listen to this. Ah, it's a nice sound. What happened in the pan, we just had a wedding. We married the extra virgin olive oil, properly infused with the garlic and the basil, together with the tomato sauce. Yeah. Chiara throws in a few ripe cherry tomatoes to intensify the flavor, and then she's done. Now we're going to leave the sauce in peace because it's honeymooning, you know, so they have to merge with each other. It's, <laughs> so it's, it's love. Give them some privacy. Yeah. <laughs> I must say, the smell of the kitchen is beginning to make my mouth water. Do you want to taste it, yes. some of the tomato sauce? Yes. This is the tomato sauce that my mother prepared for you earlier. Okay. Don't be stingy. I won't be stingy. <laughs> Don't be stingy, my dear. Grazie. Voilà, my dear. And then we can put some of the red hell on the mm. top. Mm. Nice. Mm. Mm. Bono. Bono. <laughs> but this is just a basic. Next is an age-old family recipe. Farmer's spaghetti is derived as a very simple but nutritious meal that the farmer's wives could throw together at a moment's notice. 
everything would be picked from the garden. We're going to use uh, uh, cherry tomatoes yes. for this recipe. Then we're using uh, oregano. Mmm, beautiful. Green olives without the pits. Black olives. With pips. With pips. And not last, we're using capers. I love capers. This was my mom, Jacqueline Kennedy's favorite recipe, and she loved this simple recipe. Very soon you will smell the Chanel of the kitchen, the best uh, smell ever. You've got some good lines, darling. Yeah. Chanel <laughs> number five. Yeah. <laughs> my mother chopped the parsley into the cherry tomatoes. She didn't put actually the parsley straight into the pan, because if you burn parsley, it turns into poison. All of the ingredients are added to the pan, left to cook for mere minutes, and that's it. Less than 10 minutes, spaghetti of the farmer are ready. And when we will serve this pasta, we will put no Parmigiano cheese on the pasta, because that will cover the flavor. Just use a bit of extra virgin olive oil. Ricks, please take note that this is another big no-no, along with cappuccino in the afternoon. <laughs> 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 yummy, yummy. Grazie. Mm. My goodness, I wish you had smell vision It was, this is just delicious. Mm. Uh, che odore. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. Buono. Mm. Buono. Uh, it's simple, really. And then the cherry tomatoes, the olives. Mm. Uh, this is really delicious. I just cannot express to you. You know, my mama, when she is you eating, she's always happy. This is like the Italian version of The Good Life. Slightly more aromatic, with better weather, less mud, possibly. I'm standing next to the most amazing bank of rosemary, and I've got all these herbs here. And we were merrily chucking handfuls of the most fresh, delicious tomatoes. I hate being soppy. I'm really trying quite hard this trip not to be soppy. But it's made me miss my grandmother's so much. I must say I had a tear in my eye, because, um, they both spent their lives in the kitchen, and it's that generation of women for whom there was no other choice. And yet, she still loves it. I found this incredibly inspiring. And more than that, it's just, it really reinforces that family connection when you cook like that in order to feed your nearest and dearest. There's such enormous pleasure and satisfaction in doing it when you get the chance and with lovely ingredients. <sighs> I must say, I, I must make more of an effort at home. My journey has almost reached its conclusion, but I'm still to discover the true south, a part of Italy that I know little about, from the enchanting region of Puglia, onwards to the wonders of the Polina National Park, to a crescendo in the haunting city of Matera.